Hello, everybody. I am Barnaby and I'm from Clown Spirit, where we take the power of clowning and we use it to bring lightness, joy and connection to your life and the lives of everybody around you. Now, today I bring you another conversation, and this week I'm with the absolutely amazing clown and teacher Jeff Johnson to talk about escaping the head trap. Uh, so if you love clowns and you want to keep up to date with everything in the clown world, please hit the subscribe button. Check out the courses at clown-spirit.com and support more free clowning content. Buy me a coffee. The link is in the chat, folks. See you in just a moment. Stick around. It's just a conversation with a fellow clown. It's not very serious. We're clowning around. It's really just a clown Yeah. Love that guy. I don't know who he is, but he has he's he's so tuneful. You are very welcome, everybody. Hello, wherever you are. I hope you're having an amazing day. Please, if you're there watching wherever you are, chat, chat with us. Just chat, jot into the comments. Where are you today? What's your name? Because often YouTube doesn't tell me your name. So tell me what your name is, especially if you want to be entered for today's special prize draw, which is do 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 a free place on the Clown X Masterclass with Jeff Johnson, which is coming up on the 29th of October. And you don't want to be missing that. So if you want to be entered into the draw, put your name into the comments and also just say hi anyway. Join in with the conversation because this is supposed to be interactive. We want your comments. We want your questions. Today, I'm going to be talking to the amazing Jeff Johnson. Now, he is truly a master in the clown world. Uh, he played the lead role in Slava's Snow Show. He has worked for Cirque du Soleil. He's a master faculty member at the Nouveau Clown Institute in Barcelona. You know, he performs now mostly solo with uh, these amazing shows, Asad and Open Space. But he's also very deeply invested in the investigation, exploration and teaching of you know, what happens when we enter a state of clown? What does that mean? And he has very um, iconoclastic uh, ideas about the meaning and the experience of empathy, of naive experience, creative consciousness, the, the idea of the emerging game and transcending pattern behavior and social identity, which is what we're going to be talking about today, because the topic for today's conversation is escaping the head trap. So, a uh, very, very warm welcome to Mr. Jeff Johnson. Hello, Jeff. Oh, uh, with Lucy, with Lucy. Oh, oh Lucy. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> Lucy. Hey, Barnaby, how are you? Great. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for coming on the conversations again. Thank you for having me back. Hey. <laughs> and, and, and this time, I don't have COVID, COVID negative. I, I think. I didn't Woo -hoo! Well, did like you that. test this morning, just to be sure? No, no, no. no, because I have one test left in the house, and I'm <laughs> running low on tests. I have one <laughs> test. When are you going to use it? That's the question. The one test. I don't know. You know, a, a lot of my friends um, are, are now down with COVID, uh, and um, it's terrible. It's, you know, it's a yucky thing. Mm. I remember, like, in the very early days, I had a severe... Uh, Heavy duty dizziness, headache, joint pain, a lot of the symptoms. But the diz dizziness was so bad, I was in bed for almost two months. And people say, Oh, you had COVID. But I, I asked them to give a test and they wanted 300 bucks to give a test then because it was early days, you know. There weren't many yeah. Tests. So and I now they're giving them away. Yeah, I couldn't afford it. So I was like, Who knows? Maybe I had it in the early days. It was horrible. Yeah. yeah. I had it at the time I talked with you. And it was, I had one day that was. You uh, did. Very bad. Um, I, I, I can see it. that. People are tuning in, and so I'm going to say hi to you all. Hi, John. Hi, Lee. Hi, Lynn. Uh, hi, Tracy. Uh, Ad ha let's see. Adir and Dak, who are you? Is that your name? Uh, I can't see any of you, so I, I trust Barnaby is telling you. You can't see the comments. I'm seeing them <laughs> yeah, here. Yeah, see. uh, Lynn says, yay, Lucy. Ah, Lynn. Lynn McGow. Hi, Lynn. Yeah. Lynn. Ah, good. 
Lynn is, boo, Lynn is yay, good. Jeff. Boo COVID, she says. Yeah, boo COVID. Uh, Frederico. Yeah. Frederico. And Send Susie. Hi, Susie. Susie Ferguson. Amazing. Ah, Susie. Wow, amazing. Amazing wow. clown. I'm going amazing. to be clown, clown versing with Susie hopefully very soon. Oh, great. Yeah, she's yes. wonderful. She's yeah. truly remarkable. Kathleen says hi from Toronto. Hi, Kathleen. Now, folks, if you want to be entered into the draw for the free place on Jeff's Clown X, da, 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 then put your name into the into the chat, into the comments, and say I'm in or something like that. And then X <laughs> X marks the spot, right? <laughs> oh, I think well, that's an improvement, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, okay. uh, yes. Oh, me paper face. X on the mouth. <laughs> it's an interesting kind of mask, right? The X. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, if I make a really tiny X like this, I can make a really tiny one. Well, microscopic I'm join one. this I, game now. I think we should all play this game at home. I can, can say the X. I can say the X. X on the you know, I can, make a, I can make a thing and say the X is the smallest mask in the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Uh, my ex is bigger than yours, Jeff. Well, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't bother her with any messages. <laughs> but size, size doesn't matter, right? I don't know. I mean, we have the, the clowns carry this baggage. We have the tiniest nose in the world, so we 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 have a chip on our shoulder because tiniest, tiniest nose. The tiniest. <laughs> I don't see. I, I was born with a good nose. I don't need a fake one. Yeah, but uh, I meant know, to say that the smallest you know, mask. I study mask, 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 mask. We use a grain of uh, a grain of rice as a mask. You know, black, you know, with rice or a grain of sand as a mask. Um, a piece of dirt as a mask. You know, and it's much smaller than. A... It's funny. Pedagogically, we look for little gimmicks and, and ideas. It's Amanda is is here from Nottingham. David, hi. Um, Nottingham, oh, Nottingham, Nottingham was a great, great, great city to play for. I love that. Nottingham, city. yeah. Three cheers for Nottingham. Yeah. Um, that's where um, you know Robin Hood's from, of course. <laughs> so it's a place for rebels and mystery. I love the little theater. The theater we used to play was, you know, there they had like these little cherubims on the bow, you know, on the loges and these little three D sort of things, and they would get knocked off when the balls went in the audience. Or something. But I, I like the. That theater was really special. Beautiful. Don't remember the name. Don't remember the name. So, Jeff, we are going to talk about what was it? Escaping the head trap. <laughs> well, I got I got kind of lost in my. <laughs> my <laughs> you know, cameras, the screen's wonderful. People say you can't connect with people on the screen, but the beautiful thing is you don't know what's outside of the screen. You know, if you just yeah. pull in. So you yeah. got maracas with you know dog treats anything you can imagine is here and what you don't have you can make you know yourself so uh, there's wonderful surprise about what i see around me that you can't see which yes. is different than theater where you can see things around me that i can't see you know um, people on my course that i'm teaching at the moment have been saying you know even even now some of them are saying oh, i did i haven't no, taken no, any online frozen. courses until now and because I, I thought it wouldn't be possible mm -hmm. and actually it's great like there's a real strong sense of connection and so mm -hmm. i'm excited about this master class that you're going to be teaching for me in a few weeks i keep calling it master class because yeah. that's it, exclusively for you i'm going to be teaching it for you exclusively that'll be me and barnaby i'll be teaching for barnaby and then everyone will watch <laughs> put all your <laughs> all your stuffy toys are out and we'll do a tea party yeah no, it's going to be great fun. Um, there's something magical that we can do online that uh, brings us together and in a way that really is, I think, more difficult to do in a, in a living space. So there are some advantages to, to this kind of uh, remote uh, location, remote time zones, remote uh, day experience where you are in your day. With eating yeah. And energy and then all of us coming together at this point in multi-time, like it's a multi-timeline that we're all convening on in, in some familiar point. It's fantastic to me that someone from the other side of the planet here is nine in the morning, there is right. three in the afternoon, evening, and, and, but we're here. Yeah. Um, 
and it becomes this unique moment this this point in in time which is completely unre unrepeatable i mean every, you know this yeah. particular group of people and i love the specialness of that i think these you know just it's just a two-hour class that you're going to be giving but i think it's going to be that mm. super special amazing sort of coming together of energy so i'm super excited about that and Magic, yeah. It's going to be about this same topic, right? Because because really, this is a fundamental idea. So, I was I was going to line up the scene from Scent of a Woman, and I forgot the the red Ferrari scene. What is uh -huh. what is it about this red Ferrari scene? Can you explain? Well, it's the whole movie actually that that shocked me when I saw it. You know, um, I guess the movie came out in ninety one or somewhere around there, ninety one, ninety two, which is early days of my really questioning this um, possibility of dualism between how we're trained and programmed to think uh, with responsibility, with logic, with cynicism and all this, particularly in the West, you know, we're trained with this kind of cynicism and approach to all things, being correct, um, competition, winning, you know, saying what should be said to get the best result, uh, all these yeah. kind of things factored into self-preservation versus uh, emotional uh, challenges. Can I express my emotion in a relationship? As a young man, I was still what, 22 or something at the time. So dealing with trying to be socially uh, relational, responsive and sensitive and uh, aware, but not really having a, a handle on my own identity um, and everyone around me struggling the same way in university, trying to define ourselves with titles, with degrees, with courses of study with, with focuses in life yeah. uh, trying to satisfy parents demands to get married become a doctor do whatever you know the sequence of life that's set out for us but deep down in the privacy of parties of concerts of after shows of sitting with a coffee you see something else which is this other simple reality that we enjoy company and we don't even have to speak to one another we can just sit together uh, on the grass and there's something about just sharing space. And there's an energetic component to that, which is unfortunately called quasi-science by a lot of <laughs> our logical friends. But it is something which has been around in all of human history. And it's very important, this syner synergy of frequency and um, biofield and all these things. Um, so there's a, there, there was a transition to interest in this sort of realm and at that time I was still a scientist uh, working a scientist I was a student of science and working science related job working in laboratories working with studying animal behavior child behavior whatever whatever and looking at you know pathology uh, chemi biochemistry yeah uh, so uh, very cynical very very much convinced that there's an answer to everything because I, mathematics can define things so physics yeah. is based in math science is a series of empirical uh, tests and queries and everything has an answer. But then later, realizing that uh, things like faith and, and, and what I call stupid genius, this uh, I don't have any answers, I don't understand the language, I know nothing, but I flow with it and, and, and what feels right guides me or you know, I can tell when I'm in the current or out of the current, these kinds of sensitivities um, are, a, are a form of intelligence also. So it's a more, it's a different mind. And the more I dove into or was introduced to esoteric teaching or, or old world thought processes, or the more I realized that brain is this, you know, the viscera, a visceral process implies that we are in the game or in the moment. An organic process implies something happens naturally, right? I mean, natively, but the organs, the viscera are this the first thing that a predator will eat. The second thing is the brain, because of protein content, uh, fat content, things that are useful to survive, but also... Oh, okay. So what you you're know, saying is that coming from... that that the, the, You're learning to come from this part of the body, the visceral part of the body, uh, over the brain, <laughs> or allowing this part of the body to be in balance with, this, with the brain. Well, these organs communicate with one another. You know, I mean, alchemists look at salt, different types of chemical compounds and salts that are present uh, in different organs and how those levels vary 
depending on position of planets, and, and there's actually science in that. I mean, certain planets move in certain ways. These salts and things change their... Um, How interesting. But, yeah. but these, there have been studies done that show when you hear a gunshot, you have this fight or flight re response, you know, you go toward the shot or away from it, or adrenaline goes up. But first, this reacts. Second, the motherboard calculates risk assessment, decides what action to do and put your body in direction. The first thing happens is sweat in the hands and organ response. And it's so fast that it's hard to say it's secondary, but the secondary reaction is evaluation. So we think, oh, I'm smart, and this is just guts. You know, I need a surgery, I have cancer. It's not related. But for some people, they talk about heart, like the blood pumper, as the most important thing. And, and there's, you know, lots of science to support the importance of the heart, and it has intelligence, so forth. And, but there's also the heart of the heart chakra, this gland that we're born with, Mm. that over life dissolves into nothing, but um, I believe it's the thalamic gland, I'm not sure, the one that's here, the, the name of it is thalamic, thalamus. Mm. This gland, when you're born, is the same size as your liver, when you die, it's fat. But I read that they uh, gained permission to do a kind of autopsy or examination on a swami, like a guru who died, and his was quite big, it didn't turn to fat, like he used it. So there's some like, what is the relationship of this gland to DMT production in the pineal gland and how our pineal glands are quite tiny, like the size of a green bean or green pea. Mm. But in olden days, it was the size of a walnut. So the pineal gland played a huge role in our connectedness. And, you know, in times of, uh, uh, let's say, Egyptian dynasty times, where we say we were at a higher consciousness, um, where when you went into a temple, you didn't look at the cool hieroglyphs, you were in a more holistic experience with the uh, scale of the building, the angle of the sun in the building, the, the echo, you know, all of these aspects of the architecture, together with how they modify my personal experience relationally to my surroundings and to the planet and to the source of light and to the source of gravity that holds the planet, that holds me. All this holistic way of thinking is... is, is important in a more in a higher consciousness um, connection whereas we live now in a lower consciousness period of time where we're uh, you know war and destroying the planet and all this stuff it's sort of it's sort of me 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 very shallow superficial egocentric existence and, they say is a lower consciousness but that's um, connection in the body Stephen Stephen Natmanovich who I talked to a few weeks ago and who uh, I know that you've read you know and extens extensively his work and we we've talked about it before mm -hmm. um you know is very much of this from this kind of you know uh, valuing and incorporating this kind of old world thinking and esoteric teaching that you you've been talking about mm -hmm. right and chakras and um, Vedic principles and uh, also Buddhist and Zen ideas like I I love the integration and the the connectedness um, across all these different ways of thinking. And I love to have these kinds of conversations. And I'm also wondering um, if you could give us any kind of some concrete examples of how that thinking um, at the, and is, is rooted for you in, in your work, in either as performer or teacher. Or maybe we could mm. do hit both of those a little bit. Like as a performer, where maybe from one of your shows or from your process, how is that kind of holistic approach, in, you know, there and being explored? Well, first of all, let me say this, this escaping the mind trap or whatever you want to call it implies that the brain doesn't work. Well, the brain works. The brain has to function constantly. Otherwise, uh, we have no nervous system, no sensorial experience, no ability to analyze or to make creative associations or anything. When I say stop thinking or get out of the head space, what I'm talking about is leave the ego behind. Stop worrying about social fears, judgment, rejection. They're going to kill me. I'm going to lose my job. You know, let all that go. And it's hard to do if I approach the stage as Jeff Johnson clown man making a show. Yeah. So what I found as years of doing theater as an actor or where the, the name on the marquee is the thing, and did I get cast over someone else, and looking at lists of names, and sitting at a table and introducing your name. It's very name-centric. 
and you're an artist, you're, you're, it's a job and your skill or your craft is to, to take the script and put it through Jeff Johnson because the audience wants to see it. Now, as clown, when I first started to consider it from the point of view as an actor, cast in a role, then my job was the same. I have a role to play. The role is not king, it's not Lear, it's a clown. A clown has these qualities, I must emulate them successfully. And that only took the audience so far. It puts the audience here in a mental state where they judge it and say, okay, that's good. It's, or it's not as good as the man he's portraying because it's not his, he didn't create the role, right? So you have to say, how do I make it my, he made it his own. You know, he sang the song, his own. we have this limitation of language how we, we can refer to things. But ultimately it sort of came down to letting go of the idea that I was Jeff Johnson and embracing the idea that I'm anonymo or I'm the character itself. So the investigation with Clown gave me a permission that perhaps I wasn't thinking about or considering or still don't think is correct when I'm acting in straight theater because theater is artifice. I don't see Clown as artifice. I see it as immediate experience. So if I'm an actor portraying a clown in Shakespeare, I don't think I am that clown. I think I'm an actor portraying a malaprop in a play the same way I'm an actor portraying a king. You know, funny when they're doing a Shakespearean play and looking around for actors to play, you know, one of the fools or malaprops, they start asking, do you know a clown? Do you, I'm looking for a clown. Mm. When they need the person to play Lear, they don't say, I need a king. Uh, Hello, Buckingham Palace, have you any king? <laughs> it's like so weird to me. So I started to ask myself, I'm like, what's going on? Why have you any police officers? I've been a police officer. In the <laughs> I started to think, well, we use the word character a lot in the United States as the way in Spanish you would use personaje, or in French you would say personage, or in Russia you would say personage, and you start to look at the ancient word pers persona, personari, the mask which resonated sound and projected that into the world, as Stephen, I think, is the one who illuminates in free play. I believe it's his book, or maybe it's Dario Fo, I don't remember. Per son, per sound, per sound, what you project, the person, is a good person, a good personality, has a nice personality. What you project into society on your daily basis, your clothes, your style, you say, hey, buddy, how are you? That's your personality who we are behind the mask without all this, when we go home and take the brassiere off and boom, and, you know, boom, and let it all hang out and eat the pizza and cry in our tears. That's part of who we are, but we are not defined only by the social persona. So why then on stage must I only be defined to the audience by the persona that they expect, you know, they're an analyze. So I thought, well, what if I try to explore? So in clown, there's something central to, to clowning that I think everyone understands who's watching this, which is complicité, complicidad, complicity. The key is to get the audience on your side right away so you can guide them through a process of games and experiences and absurd story, right? We're storytellers, we're players, we're provocateurs, and so for the audience to come along with us, we need complicité. That means they're with us. Mm. Really, if I have the audience with me, curious enough to boom, boom, respond to that, then we start a contract. I guide you, blah, 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 and you respond. It's a series of callbacks. I provoke, you react, and then eventually maybe they provoke and I react. But there is a play, a sort of columpio. It's that swing set I talk about. The ah, two columpio. Kids, columpio. I love it. Yeah. Yes. The two kids meet in the park or the teeter-totter. Two children meet in an empty park with all these toys and swing sets and teeter-totters and spinny things. And one goes solo and the other sits next to him, and they start matching rhythms. And it happened to me as a kid more than a few times, and i never forget it, where the kid I never met, don't know his name, turned over to me and said, you're my best friend. Because we started to smile together. We started to resonate together. Because this simple act of one leading, the other following, me leading, him following, and that, that's flip-flopping of following, leading, mm. that starts to, as you will know, studying with masks, and anyone who studies masks will know, that mask guides us as much. We don't push the mask around. We listen and respond mm. to it. Mm. So there is a give and a take. And that is this columpio, this pendulum, you know, is the same as this. 
image, right? Yeah. Which is what you see in a hospital, mm. right? Which is, which is rhythms of the heart, which is frequency. Frequency has to do with how many times the cycle happens over a segment of time, right? Amplitude is how big it goes, but frequency is how many of these waves happen over some set measure of time. Now, if I turn this on end, what do I see? I see this, a cycle, mm. because this turned on end becomes that, and that is the same as this. So I believe it was Alan Watts that first opened my eyes to the possibility of a watch or a clock, a round thing that we are first taught how to read as children, right, uh, to tell time, the big mm. hand, the little hand, the numbers laid out. It is nothing more than a ridiculous construct, a line of numbers, and we bend them into a circle, <laughs> <laughs> and we call it a clock. But I love this conversation, um, uh, Jeff, because um, you know, and it was—it's very remarkable that you just said Alan Watts. That came out of your mouth because, literally, ten seconds before you said that, I was thinking Alan Watts. Um, because you were talking about waves mm -hmm. and there's this great thing when he talks about s sound, sa you know, sound sounds like it's continuous, but it's not. It's like, well, it's sound, sound and sound, silence, sound, sound and silence. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And sound is a mechanical wave, which means that the force is going through uh, some substance and, and that's what we hear, the vibration of that stuff. It's not yeah. an electromagnetic wave. It's not that kind of wave. It's a mechanical wave. So it's it's moving material, and that uh, the little that sound comes from material moving around. So uh, the the vibration, and the universe is music. You know, it is waves. It's not things. We've yeah, learned exactly. it wrong. So it's waves. It's just a series of waves, and those waves in combination create spheroids. Multi dimensional uh, forms and, and, and really complicated entanglements. You know, in quantum theory, there's something that, you know... Uh, oh, yes, I'm glad we're talking about quantum Einstein theory. Because you, with, this is Einstein great. Yeah. With, with uh, spooky action, something that if something happens here, then 10 light years away, um, a particle related to this one will change somehow location or behavior. And you say, well, that's a spooky action. It's so far away, it doesn't make sense. Well, quantum mechanics relies on this relationship of things at any distance, close or far, uh, being reactive to each other. And this is, has to do with quantum entanglement. So it's, if, if I say that the observer dictates the position or the spin uh, of a subatomic particle, then it's not there unless you see it. Once you see it, it's there, but it's, its position will depend yeah. on the observer. So yes. people misinterpret that to say, well, if I'm falling off a building, I go, I'll land on the cushion. And it doesn't happen. And I go, splat. so therefore, you know, Chopra or someone is wrong. You know, No, they're not wrong at all. Um, that's not exactly how it works because we're not mighty and powerful enough. Maybe if the ground wasn't there, a pillow would have appeared in one of the multiverses. Or maybe a pillow will appear. But, you know, the, you can't rely on it. It's not a logical uh, yes. before the ground. I will land on a pillow. Um, this reminds me very much of um, of our conversation last time when you said that, that there's this, and, and it connects to what you just said about needing to get the connection with the audience as quickly as possible, as soon as possible, because mm -hmm. then you talked about this idea of quantum connection, where that, you know, as an observer, as an audience, you have this thought of like, oh, I want the performer to, the performer yeah. needs to or should do something like turn in this particular moment. And then they do. And there's like this kind of almost mystical uh, level of kind of vibration and connection that, that occurs, you know. Well, imagine, the... imagine someone enters a stage and they never, in, they never indicate the audience. They don't look at them. They don't acknowledge it. You know, a lot of performers go out and go, hi. <laughs> <laughs> do all this. It's like, it's like a weird stand-up, grotesque stand-up comedy or something. Yeah. Imagine you just live in the space. You know, a lot of people will say something I've heard about my performance or someone else. Well, he didn't do anything. He didn't do this. 
he didn't do that, therefore I can't call him clown. I can't, or about something. Well, it really wasn't clown, it was variety because they didn't do X, Y, and Z. It was interesting, but the same person will say, well, we're all clowns, but anything you watch anyone do is a clown show, right? So imagine you look in a window and a bird just sort of walks by. Doesn't fly, doesn't go tweet, 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 nothing, he doesn't flex his wings. It's just there. And people say, oh, a birdie. No, it wasn't flying. It didn't say tweet, tweet. It didn't sing a song. That's not a bird. Looks like a bird, but it's not a bird. What? Looks like a cat, but it didn't go like the Halloween picture. It didn't scratch anybody. It's not a cat. Um, so, so what's the analogy? Likewise, and putting, clown putting all this on, well, likewise, putting all this on to me right. doesn't seem. So it's like this weird koan. There is something missing when we don't feel connected, whether their example seems bizarre or my example, the dressing up like a clown doesn't yes. say clown seems bizarre. Both are saying, are having the same struggle, I think. They, I or they, or this person or that person is not resonating with what they're seeing. So when I talk about complicity, I don't mean, hey, you and me, you and me, we're connected, you got me. <laughs> I don't mean that. It, there's a feeling too, there's a refined sensitivity that we all have and the question mm. is as a performer do you have the ability to let down your guard to let down your <laughs> to relax you can still go like this but to be aware of each and every center of mass in front of you so that when you're not looking you can feel someone's mass shift you know it's all yeah. about the center of mass so if i i, if I have to say if i say i could try first and watch your reaction on the screen because on my screen, you're to my left. I don't know where you are and where I am in relation to you. But if I do this or this or this, eventually I'm going to notice that you're smiling, that you're changing, that your anima has changed. Something shifted. And that shift drives me, it gives me information, loads of information. So I always, something that helped me greatly was to realize. Something else Alan Watts said that really stays with me is that we are all um, the I that I am trying to understand. The I that I am trying to understand is you. It mm. is this keyboard. It is this material. It is the whole universe. So in this way, I am the universe trying to sort out who I am in this yes. way. And Beautiful. you are the I that I am trying to sort out, but I can see you, I can meet you, I can hug you, I can have dinner with you, but I cannot do it with myself. And this, in this combined attention, we feel this connection to a deeper I. And when 2,000 people or 200 or 20 connect, mm -hmm. we feel an even more profound connection. So in this way, we are all waves of the same ocean we are therefore the same we're all drops of water of the same sky or however you want to think of it we are yeah. all part of this massive organism so when we come in as social egos as persona as mass what we project with all our worries and fears to self-preserve and we sit in darkness or in light and we tune into something and don't think we escape the trap of worrying about all this uh, we're engaged through the senses to what's happening in front of us, around us, the laughter, the changes in energy, the shifts in motion and, and, and gravity. We become part of an epic event. We become mm. part of this movement. And there is this frequency, this exchange of, in, of energy and, and, and flow. And when we're in that space, it feels great because we feel we're part of a community, a mm. bigger I, a bigger observer. Now, that powerful group of people do lock into each other. They do become like one energy field, one battery. Maybe there's a few that don't uh, charge in, but we can work with that. Once you get that going, you have this incredible information source. It's like a, a sun, it's a beacon. Mm. So the lightest shift you do, you can feel in them. And it's if I have people in front of me and I do this, I don't say a word, whether it's on stage or in a workshop, I can just do this. Just repeat a gesture that has no sense. But if there's a chair near me, someone will get up and run to the chair if they feel I'm indicating to them something. They'll try to sort it out. Maybe they, what do you want me to do? They'll talk to someone. They want permission. Yeah. <laughs> but eventually someone will 
move. And once that game is established, I can do whatever I want. I can make strange yeah. shapes and they start to interpret it and they start doing dance or they start taking their shoes and making shit. Or, you know, people reveal a very simple truth of themselves just following the indication. And that makes me a Jedi because all I have to do is move yep. my hand. The entire mass of <laughs> moves across the room and lifts an object and breathes it. So, so I can bring Jeff. To to yeah. I want, to, I want to be, uh, you know, because I, I recognize exactly what you're talking about, the feeling, because I've had it on stage. But, but I've also recognized the opposite, right? Where I am on stage and I'm stuck and I'm like mm -hmm. pushing and I'm all in my head and I don't, and I, and I don't know where, you know, how to get that feeling back. So I feel like I want to take you a masterclass because, you know, I want some tools and I feel like you, you've got them there. So in the, in the Clown X, which by the way, everyone, Clown X is this new thing that's coming your way, which is amazing opportunities to work with Jeff and people who are in that kind of stratosphere once a month doing two hour sessions where he, they will talk, they will give you practical exercises, you can ask questions. This is kind of like an intimate, up close and personal encounter with, um, you know, with top level teachers of clowning and, and other areas. So what I'm interested in is, from my point of view, I feel like I need some of these tools to help get out of the head trap. We might try this, Clowniador X. <laughs> Why? Like Theodore. Because Theodore, right? Yeah. Isn't Ted short for Theodore? <laughs> oh, Ted, as in Ted, Theodore, Ted, yes. That's <laughs> I thought you were going for some... Um... Clown Theodore. <laughs> clowns, I adore. clowns I adore. It could be. I don't know. <laughs> clowns we adore. Ah, oh, but it also implies the mystery that is really at the heart, at the heart the mysterious component of what each of us brings when we embrace the joy that we want to express, the joy that we have in stupid things, but also the way that we respond to the world, the way we make the world respond, the way that we splash the pool. You know, each of us is unique, completely unique in the way that we process uh, information through personal experience. And sharing that helps us to gain confidence in just how much of that experience we overlap because we, we're, we're sort of programmed to believe we don't overlap. You know, they're different, they're not me. You know, we have to, to choose a tribe. And I mean, there, there's a wonderful power in embracing the confidence in you because that's a superpower. You know, that is a unique gift of yeah. how you perceive things and how you associate creatively um, you know, how you see something and see what it could be. You know, this is, uh, looks like a banana, taba, platano, tabasco in Mexico, they would say, a regular banana. Some people would say, oh, it's a banana peel, you slip on it. Uh, maybe someone would see a banana split someday. Someone would see the telephone. Someone would see a bad nose. Very few people will see the worst Batman mask ever created. Or, you know, it, remember, anything could be the worst of anything, and that's okay. And when I embrace that, I said, I can be the worst in this moment, and that's okay. I can be lost on stage. I can be paralyzed. That happens all the time, especially in the free, absolutely free zones where I'm just sort of responding to what I see and what I feel. The moment I have no clue what I'm going to do next, but I have a sense of the level of tolerance of the viewer or the spectator, and like, I, can, I can feel that, oh, I better do something now. So I just, you just start moving things Yeah. against the background. Now they're cards. Well, now it's easy. Now I have a game. <laughs> I win. But are these are these some of the kinds of things that we'll be doing in the in the class with you, Jeff? These kinds of um, exercises. I find it uh, very useful to reveal some of the things. Like, do you have anything to write with? Uh, yeah. Do you have a pen and paper, so everybody can play along. But I can only see you, so it's only going to work for me with you. So I would yeah, say cut. Cut, cut, do you have, or cut or tear one piece in half, you know, like a magician, right? You know, yeah. I, I'm making it up as I go. Okay. It's doing an interesting thing with my um, my green screen background. It's sort of picking yeah. up. Yeah. So you take this 
and you go aggregate cadaver and you change it into a no, I'm not doing that. Um, so take a pen, pencil, and make a, a circle anywhere, anywhere you like on the card, anywhere you like. Make this a circle. Okay. Don't think. Right? right. And show me. Show me. I don't trust you. Ah, you're doing the interesting thing. Okay. So choose one word from the following list: uh, donut, uh, automobile, or hippopotamus. Choose one of those, and then draw it anywhere on the card. Donut, automobile, hippopotamus. Draw that anywhere on the card. Like so. Okay. okay. Um, now, put your name, but take the first letter and last letter off, but all the rest. Mm -hmm. Great. Now, connect them somehow. I don't say how. Connect them any way you want, all three. Now, without any thought, just following directions. I gave directions, staying in the game, doing what, you know. But with the freedom to do it however I want, I came up with this image. Mm. Without thinking too much about it. I connected it like that. Now, when I look at this again, I say, what do I see? And immediately what I see when I look at this is two possibilities. Well, and as I start to describe them, they start to multiply, of course. So I have to refrain from grabbing all of them. But the first one I saw was a tree with these things inside. Mm -hmm. So then my brain mm -hmm. wants to describe what is it that, what's the story here? How did this creature, that whatever it is, and that end up in a tree? Then I say, no, it's a thought bubble. Okay because I connected them with this weird shape. So it's a thought bubble. Then what is the thought? From nothing more than doodles that come not from my brain, but from indications around me, responding to information that is available to me all the time. But here I focused it right to you. I have a set of visual graphic images that I have created with my hand and watched with my brain, right? So my mind has seen me created physically and has participated in the associations that guided the drawing and arranged the composition. Show me yours and your connectedness. Did you use lines or how did you connect it? Okay, see, you also did a very creative way to connect it. Now, when you look at that, tell me what you see. Well, it's interesting. I see a pair of headphones. Yeah. Uh, and they're zapping uh, something into me. Uh huh. Okay. What so else do you like, see? Do you I see it in your screen? If you hold it next to your face and your screen and slowly move it toward your face, what do you see? Do you see any other possibilities? Now, I'm sharing with you what I see. Now, if you cover your face with it ever so slowly, do you see something? I'm sharing with you what I see, right? Just leave it on the middle of your face. So if I, <laughs> if I try to emulate it, uh, you're drawing and... It's kind of like an alien. Yeah. If I emulate it for you, so you can sort of see what I see. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like a mask or an alien, right? So it's fantastic. So I've shared with you what I saw. You've shared with me what you see. And what you see is related to what is immediately around you and what we talked about before we went on air, right? The headphones and the and this whole like voice through that whatever it, it just opens an incredible attic full of files and books and other associations that yeah. then we can draw from so together in three seconds doing doodles you and i have created a, a range of stories that we can share combine or concentrate on this we can say now by turning sideways upside down we start looking at it from different angles i love to it find experiences. So in and, very short time, with 20 people, with 50 people, with 30 people, yeah. we, have enough, we have enough material to create you know, a massive, massive show. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm gonna, I want to put this on my wall and, and have it um, be sort of inspiring and sparking off things for me. Well, I mean, this is really, really cool, Jeff. I, it was so, I, what, I, what was amazing about that was how, sh how quickly we got to that, something really deep, like in seconds. Let's try another one. Call back. Everyone uses callback in some way in, in stand-up or in comedy or in cabaret and clown, right? Uh, but, but.
Bang. 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 And I hope that someone will do it with me. <laughs> they don't. Ah. And I can create a loop. I can have some people doing this, some people doing that. Some people. And eventually we have an orchestra, a whole audience. I mean, no, your mama, your mama, this section, the other one. No, daddy, no, no, daddy, no. Spider Man, Spider Man, Spider Man, Spider Man. Booby, 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 booby. You have a whole audience doing this, and it's a raucous chorus. And we bring it up, we can swell it, bring louder, below. Using callback to unite the audience into a rhythmic cacophonous symphony and letting that play out. And they'll start to play and they'll start to, to misspeak and that will influence the person next to them. And it starts to become this morphing thing. From that, I can find a dance or a scene. I can expand it into the stage. I can separate, I can break it. So that's the most simple way that children can relate to um, mm -hmm. organizing attention through callbacks we do it as, as educators all the time i just think that um i, I think uh, you guys listening that this this master class with jeff is going to be like an incredible sort of um uh improvisation uh, a group improvisation that will happen uh in part in part yes 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 in and, part and you Absolutely. and you will be we will all be part of this thing that will never occur again um, also, hopefully, like a kind of sharing or a kind of thing. There's something magical that happens when we're connected in the game and playing and, and feeling good and we start to flow together. Yeah. The things that are shared begin to overlap. If I say to you right now, for example, draw me a, a fish, just draw a fish and don't show it to me until I say go. Ready? Draw a fish uh, and, and draw me a fish. Uh, and okay. Just, just draw a fish. And I'm going to purposefully... Um, well, I'll, I'll explain later. I'm going to draw a fish. And we'll see what happens. Now, my fish was completely egocentric. I wasn't listening to you. I wasn't thinking about your fish. I just cared about my fish and drew my fish. Okay? And my fish is this fish. It's my fish. My fish, isn't it? My fish is this fish. Mm. Show me your fish. Okay, this is my fish. Uh-huh. Now, great. See how your fish and my fish are not the same? Now, let's... Now, let me change this a bit. Let's... Let us... We could, like, transform together. one fish into the other fish. Let us draw something together instead of drawing my fish and your fish. Let okay. us try to draw something together. And I'll say something simple. Draw a tree, Barnaby. Let, let's draw a tree. So first we need the top of the tree, and we'll draw the top of the tree. Then we need the bottom of the tree, and we'll draw the bottom of the tree. Next to the tree, we should draw a little um, house. Now these are pretty standard and basic concepts, right, from childhood. Um, now, in the sky, we need to draw, we need to draw a mighty dragon. Now, I'm not the best at drawing. And I don't say that to apologize. I say it to explain why what you see may not be clear. <laughs> and... Use color if you want, if you have it, don't use color. And anyway, so we, we will have a bit of fun. And together, I hope you're all doing this at home, by the way. <laughs> I'm doing it uh, in my hut. So when you're ready, let me know. And we, we shall share our tree, top and bottom, our house and dragon in the sky. And I'm curious if compositionally anything is similar. Whoops. Uh, uh -huh. Interesting. Now, from this, there is <laughs> a lot of interest. So trees are basic. Jeff, you've drawn uh, your dragon up other side of the tree between the dragon and the house. Mm. I put the dragon mm. over the house, basically because that's where I had more room, I thought. Um, mm. Now, let me ask you this. Very simple. Um, this, when we draw together is interesting let me let me just take the one difference that we really have 
is dragon placement, right? Lee says, Lee was doing it at home, and Lee said, my house was on the other side too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, the house could be on the other side. So let's draw a house on the other side. Let's take Lee's advice and do a house on the other side. Great. So now, I'm going to match it roof-wise. So now, if we do house on the other side, like that, is that what you mean on the other side, Lee? I suppose. Now, what's centric? What is the thing that is, uh, it's so basic, but when we look at it, what we've drawn, how many people draw the tree uh, falling down from a hurricane or on top of the house or smaller? I don't know. But yeah, mm. let's look at that. If you put another dragon in the sky above the other house, you'll have the same as I have, which is in the middle, we have one thing. this yeah we all put the tree in the middle we both put the tree in the middle this is, this right. is true. and why why is that well maybe because you said it first yes and so i said what first you said the top what of the, the tree right and so where did you put the top of the tree in the top in the middle yeah why not put it here Because I don't know. I, I suppose because you, when you say things first, it me it sort of suggests that they're the most important. So you're going to give them. So even if I put it here, you think because you're remembering your tree scale, you say, "But Jeff, the tree's fallen over. Are you going to turn it?" You say, "No, it's just got a little teeny teeny." <laughs> My tree's you know? fallen over now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So and now be careful because you have a very phallic drawing. If you <laughs> turn it over. yeah. So the point is. There is no right or wrong, but even if I present it as a great um, thesis, okay, yeah. now let's do it like that. I put your brain into action. You're curious, well, what's going to happen? Now I have to investigate his thesis. I put the tree in the middle, and it doesn't matter. The thing that matters <laughs> is realizing once you have it all down, bypassing all this worry, you have all this splendid possibility, and it's all great. And the more detail we include from everyone, the more fun we have, it becomes a mural. It becomes a community yeah. mural. Yeah. We used to do in school on the paper when all the kids got paint and painted along. We weren't worried about where to put the mouse or you know, we should put our little son over here. Yeah. But then we were told, no, it has to be within the lines. It has to be in the proper scale. It has to be this and that. So we become very paralyzed. And if I, as a teacher, trick your brain and start to say things like, like you've heard before, these are the rules, but there are no rules explained, and you start to... If the brain can be occupied mm. to free itself from its own stupid predilection, mm. what happens? We proceed with the things that give us more excitement. We proceed. We can say, okay, we forgive. We're not worried about judging. We just, okay, I'll do it. Doesn't make sense, but I'll do it. What's this? And at the end, everyone's smiling and going, oh, shit. It really doesn't matter. That was just fun to, to draw for once. You know, I was so serious person. Yeah. I just doodled for 10 minutes. But there's something more magic when you have more, more inputs with song creation. Take Choose one of these phrases, choose this, choose this, make a poem, the songs, the poems, the illustrations of those poems. This is what we do in life. It's how we express love to each other. It's how we express emotion. And it's also how we identify with each other. And it's how we play effectively on stage. We, I, we include the audience emotion, attention, and sensitivity. We can detect that by simple shifts in mass. Are they back? Are they forward? Are they smiling? Energy, learning to be sensitive to those things. And, and that is a powerful tool because from that you can create. Yeah, and it, I mean, what you're talking about is empathy in a sense. In the, in, and these, what I love about how you talk about these things is that you're constantly switching back and forth between the stage former applications of these things and then just how they are present and, and so significant in in everybody's life right so it, mm -hmm. it seems to me that this is for me what is so exciting about how i'm how i i'm trying to bring clowning into the world and the people like yourself who i'm kind of connecting with 
the common thread there seems to be that we are we are interested in clowning for for a much bigger sense of um of its of its relevance and an application in people's lives beyond the the world of theater and and stage i mean the Absolutely. exercise you you proposing here would be incredibly valuable and enriching for you know any single human being on the planet whether or not they're interested in in clowning or not 100 percent, 100 percent. not my approach is never dictated by actor stage performer is dictated by uh, someone who lives life and seeks the confidence to live in the joy. You know, people mm. say, are you happy? I say, well, happy is a state that's impossible to maintain. So I can be miserable, but have joy in this moment because yeah. I, my misery has to do with things that have nothing to do with this opportunity to encounter an audience, to play with an object, to re- um, uh, reintroduce myself to an old um, play or an old uh, game or you know we play football or tennis with friends and maybe you play for 20 years it's never the same you have a new opponent you have a new friend mm -hmm. to play mm -hmm. with that that enrichment of a game you love chess backgammon whatever you play games are wonderful they're not about just winning that's a vehicle to take us through a process of encountering ebb and flow and and sensing this vibrancy of what I believe to be a native instinct which makes us human, which is empathy. Empathy, unfortunately, is now talked about as a behavior, a social behavior that we somehow pretend in order so that we are regarded with better favor. Yeah. That is that's playing to the capitalist model. If you do this, you win. If you mm. uh, behave properly, they will be nice to you. No, I believe mm. you are inherently identifying with life conditions of others because we're so hungry to be understood and we're so afraid to reveal ourselves because we're so condemned for the things we don't even fully understand about yeah. ourselves. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, we yeah, do yeah. a little bit of this and society says, no, that's not permitted. But it is permitted to be human. It is permitted to, to, to love people when they die. It is permitted to, you know, it's permitted for us to come together. And that's what makes clowns such a healing potential in hospitals. But just going in a hospital, for example, with the ukulele, go bye bye, baby, bye bye, making noise, you can be, you can flatline something. <laughs> and that's happened. I knew a girl who flatlined a patient and was traumatized. I would have died, and the girl like went in hiding. And nothing to do with her. But it, it, <laughs> so there's a lot of, I believe, uh, challenges in terms of language and communication and how we communicate ideas mm. because things mm. are on paper the same as they've always been, but we're interpreting them in new ways that are mm -hmm. egocentric, mm -hmm. limited, and limiting. And I think creative association, creativity is, you know, people say a lot of books, some people are creative, other people are not. That's, you know, I, I disagree. If you're hungry, you go to the refrigerator, and maybe you have an idea, I'll have a sandwich, I have that loaf of bread, I have that new cheese, I want, oh, we have the leftover ham, and I've got a yeah. nice tomato, and, and you go there, and none of those ingredients are there. Someone decided to have a picnic and stole all your bread and everything, and do you panic and go, oh, or do you go, oh, I'm hungry here. Well, look, casserole. Yeah, I'm going to warm that up. I mean, you adapt. Or you say, I'll take this and this and this, and oh, peanut butter and jelly with banana. I haven't had that in a while. No bread. <laughs> Tortillas, peanut butter and jelly. Uh, <laughs> quesadillas. No, no, peanut butter and no, You start to invent crazy things. So everyone's creative in a way. Or, you know, I think everyone has a capacity to love and to understand love and to receive it. So therefore, we're creative because we have the ability to um, to be in the moment, to change the status of the water by splashing it with our hand. That's what I talk about. The audience is like a pool. If I go like this, how does yes. the water respond? Is it frozen? Does it go, ah? <laughs> it goes bloosh or splash or splash, bloosh, bloosh, bloosh. you know. And so we're constantly testing the water. And once we're splashing it and we surf on it and we hula hula and we... You know, and if we have the permission, the opportunity, and the possibility for that, it's wonderful. Now, a lot of people fear it and say, well, that's okay. You're famous, or you're this, and it's very easy, and they don't care what you do. They just want to come see you, so you can do anything. Well, they don't know me. I mean, I'm just a fat guy. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it just, you go to a supermarket. I do the same thing in a, in a supermarket. Hi, how are you? Uh, the cookies are on my head, like, a, mm, you know. There's just opportunity and craziness, and I live in this craziness often, uh, which is inappropriate for some people, but it creates a lot of smiles. I believe well, that people are 
constantly playing in life. I love everyone. I love, I love, I love you, Jeff. You're an amazing person. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that with all this stuff with us today. I just feel like I'm bursting with ideas and possibilities. And um, I hate to draw it to a close, but we've been talking for an hour. And I just want to say to all the folks watching, thanks so much for being part of this conversation. And this is a last opportunity. If you want to be entered into the draw for this free place for Jeff's Clown X, the inaugural Clown X on October 29th, then put your name into the comments right now because that is the a record. Be, I encourage people to participate in this Clown X, not with Jeff, because of you. This is a, it's a, a launch. It's the first one we're going to do. And it's about all of us. I'm not going to say it's about you or about me. It's about all of us. I see this as an encuentro, as an encounter, as a chance, an opportunity for us to meet, and for all of us to meet, so that we have this coming together. It's a unique experience. Wh whichever teacher or invitee is doing it, you're going to have a unique experience. So as the first one, it would be really great to have you there. And uh, thank you, Barnaby, uh, as always, for inviting me, and especially for inviting me back. This is really special. And to talk about the things that are so uh, dear to me. And thank you to anyone who's been here watching live and those who watch later. Um, thank you for watching this. And, and do subscribe to Barnaby's channel, please, because this is a growing field uh, internationally, and he's doing a lot of hard work to bring all these voices together. So I encourage you to subscribe and, and hit the bell icon to get notifications and also sign up for the Clownex. It will be worth it. Trust me. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Jeff. See you again soon. See you, buddy. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was absolutely incredible. Um, I feel like I escaped the mind trap for a whole hour of just joy, pleasure, play, right? Playing around with ideas and just having fun and just learning a whole lot and feeling profound connection. And, you know, this is what Jeff's talking about. This is what's going to happen on the 29th of October. So I hope you can join us for that. In the meantime, um, please, if you want this free content to keep coming, I have this way that you can support the work I'm doing. It's called Buy Me A Coffee. I'm going to put the link into the chat right now. If you go there, you can buy me a coffee. A coffee costs $5. Or you can buy two or you can buy three. I will not spend it on coffee. Well, I may. Or I may just spend it on other things that I need. It's a way of keeping clown spirit going and showing your love and your support for this work and helping us get clowning out there into the world in a bigger and bigger way every day. So thank you so much, everybody. Remember, mark it in your diaries, in your calendars right now, October 29th. It's a Saturday. It's going to be at 9 a.m., I think, Pacific time, whatever time that is for you. It's going to be a two-hour thing, awesome thing, Clown X with Jeff Johnson. But it's us. It's all of us, as Jeff was saying. So... That's it. I just want to say next week, I'm talking to John Gilkey from, from LA, a very cool clown on Clownversation. So I hope you can join me for that. Until then, goodbye and keep clowning. Bye, everyone.